Hello, this is Robin Walker. I'm the Black History Man. This is Kush University, and class is in session. Greetings, the presentation is called Where Should We Direct Research into Prehistoric Britain? As ever, we are interested in the role black people played in this prehistory. Now, I came across a book many years ago called Early Britain, and the author was Alfred J. Church. The book itself went through many, many editions. The one I have is the 1896 edition. And if we were to turn over the page and look what's there, I'm going to start from page two, and we're going to get into page three of the book. And the author says, he has a section, Britain before the Romans. What does he say? The island was inhabited probably at this time, and certainly afterwards when we reached a historical period by two races of men. Tacitus writing about the end of the first century of our era, says that the physical character of the inhabitants of Britain differs much. One part of them, he speaks of these under the name of Siluris, had dark complexions and for the most part curly hair. These he identified with the Iberians or inhabitants of Spain. The other part, he says, resembled the Gauls, they had red hair and were tall of stature. Now, if we analyze what Alfred J. Church has just told us, when the Romans came to Britain, there were two populations living here. One population was dark complexioned with curly hair, and the other population was presumably white with red hair. So who were these populations? I'm going to read on some more of what Alfred J. Church has. Caesar, of whom we shall hear more in the following chapters, writing about a century and a half before Tacitus, gives testimony to much the same effect, that the interior of Britain was inhabited by a race which considered itself to be indigenous, the seacoast by another people which, in search of adventure or booty, had crossed over from Belgic Gaul. This people, he tells us, still retained the names by which its various tribes were known on the mainland. So Caesar is telling us that there are, again, two populations, an indigenous population and the Gaul population. The Gauls are who we would today call the Celts. And the reason why they had the names that they held when they lived on the European mainland is because that's where they originated. On the European mainland, they came to Britain, and there were already people living here, the Siluris, and the Siluris, we've already been told, are dark-complexioned and, for the most part, curly-haired. So that raises some obvious questions. How dark? How curly? Is this a reference to black people as we understand them today? Another thing that Alfred J. Church tells us is that this dark population looked like the Iberians, the people of Spain. But that's not the people of Spain today. That's the people of Spain 2,000, 3,000 years ago. A very different population. So you cannot imagine a modern Spaniard and think, oh, well, we're talking about modern Spaniards. We're not. We're talking about prehistoric populations of Spain. And the big question we still want to ask and answer is how dark and how curly. I came across another book called Prehistoric Remains of Caithness. And this book was written by Samuel Lang, who was an English MP. And it has an anthropological uh, appendix called Notes on the Human Remains, written by a very learned anthropological professor, Thomas Huxley. And this book was published in 1896. So let's take a look at what's here. So I'm going to turn over the page, and I'm going to quote from page 62. It says, 
unknown ages may have elapsed in a state of savagery too dense and animal-like to leave records, until some fortunate impulse from without or improvement from within raised the race to the level where they buried their dead in kists and raised tumuli and dwellings, at first simple and humble, but by degrees more massive and complicated, until at length the stone civilization culminated in such national monuments and temples as the circles of Stonehenge and Stenness. So according to um, Samuel Lang, the people responsible were originally savages, and then those savages improved their culture, improved their culture, improved their culture to the point where they built a stone civilization in Britain. Monuments like Stonehenge, monuments like Stenness. On the same page, the same scholar Samuel Lang goes on to have a section called Type of Race. Who were the people who built this stone civilization? We read, the valuable memoir which Professor Huxley has been kind enough to subjoin places the anatomical facts fully before the scientific world, and it only remains for me to add a few general remarks. It is a most important and interesting fact that in association with these very rude and primitive remains, a type of human race should have been discovered so savage and degraded as to present more resemblance to the lowest Australian than to any historical European race. So as we're reading this, of course, many of us will shudder at the overtly racist language coming through from the pen of Samuel Lang. But let's not worry about that. He's just said the ancient Britons look like the Australian Aborigines. And that's a powerful piece of data, because it's not very often that you see them presented as, as looking like the Australian Aborigines, but that is what the physical anthropological work of Professor Thomas Huxley concluded in 1896. And these Australian Aborigine look-alike populations were probably the dark, uh, curly-haired Silurids described by Tacitus and indirectly described from the time of Caesar. And so if we want to know who were these very ancient Britons responsible for building Stonehenge, responsible for building Stenness, we have it here. Present more resemblance to the lowest Australian. In other words, to the Australian Aborigines. Again, I apologize to the people watching this for the racist language. But here it is, an 1866 book. All right, so what other evidence do we have? New evidence from Africa was reported in that uh, paper of liberalism and scholarship, the Daily Mail. No paper is more bigoted and more right-wing. But let's read what it says. This is us. Earliest fossils of our species found in Morocco... And then we have the date of the article, uh, 7th of June, 2017. And the article goes on to say, the oldest human remains in the world were found in Africa, and they now think Morocco, whereas previous scholarship said East Africa. Let's read what it says. The bones, about 300,000 years old, were unearthed thousands of miles from the previous record holder found in fossil-rich eastern Africa. The new discovery reveals people from an early stage of our species' evolution with a mix of modern and more primitive traits. And so Morocco then is a possible place where the human race are uh, evolved, but as they've said, these early humans did have some very ancient traits as well as modern human traits. And so it could be that if we wanted to trace the evolution of humans, Morocco could be a part of the story, East Africa could be the next step in the story. 
And then they reconstructed a 160,000-year-old Moroccan, and they showed the face, and this face needs to be seen. Let me put it like that. Then there's new evidence from South America. The Daily Mail, again, that bastion of liberalism. Again, this is 6th of June 2017. The article says, were Africans the first Americans? 3D reconstruction of 10,000-year-old caveman's face controversially challenges long-held theories about the first settlers. So what the mail is reporting on is new research into ancient America shows that the very first people there did not look like the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans. The very first people there were actually black people. And an even older find was found in Brazil, and a woman's uh, a skeleton was found, and it was reconstructed, and they call this woman Luzia, and they've subsequently reconstructed the images where you can see the hair, and the hair is interesting, and the hair tells a powerful story, and again, this hair needs to be seen. So we've already established then, Africa is the cradle of the human race. The very first people in the Americas were black people. So that raises some obvious questions. What do we know about the first inhabitants of Northern Europe? I have here an article from Sweden, and the article was from Russia today, and the article is the 18th of February, 2019. And why Russia today reported the article is because a documentary was made on who the first people in Sweden were, and that upset the alt-rightists in Sweden. And I'm going to read the title of the Russia Today article, and the article says, Documentary about dark-skinned first Swedes sparks horror on Twitter. And... If I was Swedish and I was an alt-rightist, I could imagine why it would spark horror. So if you now have the first people in Africa, the first people in the Americas, the first people in Sweden, well, Britain is also in Northern Europe. Who were the first people there? Well, the Daily Telegraph has an article called The First Britons Were Black natural history museum DNA study reveals. And then the research that went to Ireland, and there's an article that says, first Irish population had dark skin similar to Cheddar Man, DNA research suggests. So not only then is it Sweden, the story has moved to mainland Britain, the story has moved to Ireland, and then the story then went to television news, and this is what was reported on Channel 4 television. Now, 10,000 years ago, Britons would have been black, according to groundbreaking genome analysis. A team from London's Natural History Museum carried out DNA tests on the Stone Age Cheddar Man, Britain's oldest near-complete human skeleton. Scientists then used the data to complete a facial reconstruction, with surprising for some results, as our science editor Tom Clark reports. He was found in Goff's cave in Cheddar Gorge in Somerset in 1903. Cheddar Man has long been believed to be the oldest known complete skeleton from a time when humans came to live in Britain permanently. And it's long been assumed he's as white as Cheddar. Here's a previous reconstruction of his face. But now Cheddar Man's DNA has revealed he looked very different indeed. That's right, the first resident Britons were black, with blue eyes and wavy hair. Researchers have an inkling that our ancestors were darker skinned than we were, but they had no idea that some of them could be this dark. And for those of us who identify as being white British, it's now reasonable to ask, well, what does that actually mean? Indeed, what does that actually mean? And following that idea, the next question now is, well, what are the consequences of this data? A comedian wrote an article for The Independent, 
And the comedian's article, this was written by Mark Steele. He wrote, the discovery of Cheddar Man means that when UKIP gets into power, they'll now deport all the white people. Let's read on. The discovery that this cave dweller from 10,000 years ago was black, meaning that British cavemen were black, will cause a huge amount of office work because British racists will have to rewrite their leaflets and redesign their websites and start shouting, this country should be for British people with pure British blood, for the true black race, not these white immigrants that have come over here diluting our British genes, says Mark Steele, uh, 8th of February 2018. Now the next question is, did the population remain consistent from the Cheddar Man period to the Stonehenge period. If it remained consistent, then this would be evidence that these early black Britons built Stonehenge and Sten Ness and so on. So did the population remain consistent? Well, this is what the BBC website says, 21st of February 2018. The BBC website says, ancient Britons replaced by newcomers. We read on. The ancient population of Britain was almost completely replaced by newcomers about 4,500 years ago, a study shows. We then turn over the page. We read. Professor Reich told BBC News, archaeologists ever since the Second World War have been very skeptical about proposals of large-scale movements of people in prehistory. But what the genetics are showing, with the clearest example now in Britain, at Beaker times, is that these large-scale migrations occurred even after the spread of agriculture. The genetic data from more than 150 ancient British genomes reveals that the Beakers were a distinct population from the Neolithic British, and their arrival on the island, Beaker genes appear to swamp those of the native farmers. In other words, your original population of black Britons were joined by a new population. Professor Wright goes on to say, the previous inhabitants had just put up the big stones at Stonehenge, which became a national place of pilgrimage as reflected by goods brought from the far corners of Britain. So who built Stonehenge? The previous inhabitants. That would mean you know, the black are cheddar man-looking inhabitants. That's powerful data. We read on. Another intriguing possibility links the Beaker people with the spread of Celtic languages. According to this theory, then, the Celts, who are the second population to come to Britain, may well have been the Beaker folks, the people making the first Beakers, coming in 4,500 years ago. But even here, they're not sure. This is what we read. Indeed, many archaeologists and linguists believe Celtic spread thousands of years later. So we're not entirely sure whether these newcomers were Celts. But according to what we now know, it seems that there was a continuity of population from Cheddar down to the Stonehenge era. And if that's so, then the theory that Stonehenge was built by Australian Aborigine-looking populations seems to be solid. But again, I'm a firm believer that even more research needs to be done to prove the continuity of population. And if that's so, then we have the first chapter of Black British history written, and that is what would be in the chapter. So that concludes the presentation on where should we direct research into prehistoric Britain.